Well, after a nine-hour long board meeting of the Reserve Bank of India, some decisions have been taken, others have been pushed forward. Uh, joining us now to discuss the impact and the implications of uh, what the Reserve Bank board decided on yesterday is the former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Montek Singh Aluwalia. Sir, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, well, post that nine-hour board meeting, it looks like a truce, if we may call it an uneasy truce, has been arrived at. Some decisions have been taken, but others have been postponed to a later date. December 14th is the next board meeting of the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, to start with, what did you make of the statement that was issued by the RBI in general, but specifically on the economic capital framework? Uh, the government and the Reserve Bank will together set up a committee to look at this issue, but we just heard there from the Niti Aayog vice chairman saying very clearly he believes that this will go into execution in this financial year itself. Well, I mean, I haven't seen all these individual statements, but let me just say that, you know, uh, I think the press built up uh, what looked like a conflict situation uh, and I think that would have been very unfortunate. So I'm sure that financial markets uh, welcome the fact uh, that we don't have that kind of conflict. Uh, there's been a long board meeting. They've agreed to do certain things. Uh, there's not a sense uh, of the RBI being pushed uh, to doing things that it really doesn't want to do. You know, on the other hand, I mean, it's clear that between the finance ministry and the Reserve Bank, Historically, I mean, there's always been a certain amount of tension. I don't think anybody minds that. Uh, this needs to be managed in a way uh, which doesn't look as if the system is breaking down. And I'm glad that uh, the way things have turned out, uh, nobody is saying that the system is breaking down. Let's see what they do uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Specifically on the economic capital framework, sir, because that has been a contentious issue. And now the decision is that a committee will be set up to look at that issue and look into the future implications of uh, this framework. Uh, uh, what would your expectation be? We've had committees in the past examine this issue. What would your expectation be in this context and given the fact that we've got an election coming up in May next year? If you're, you're referring to the issue of how large uh, the RBI's capital reserves should be and whether some portion of this can be transferred, if that's what you're talking about, you know, my feeling is that uh, this whole fuss uh, of trying to make, uh, make an economic issue of this is not actually well, um, well grounded. I mean, the honest truth is that if you take, the RBI can always print money. Uh, stability means that it's total, the total money that it prints, what you might call the increase of reserve money in the system, should be constrained to whatever is felt to be consistent with a reasonable rate of inflation and growth and so on. Now, if you take away a lot of money, uh, give it to the government under whatever pretext, and if the Reserve Bank maintain stability, they'll just reduce the amount of reserve money that they issue into the rest of the system. Mm. So, you know, the net effect, the net effect from the government's point of view is not particularly different. I, I personally do not think that uh, raiding the reserve bank uh, reserves is a credible way of appearing to reduce the fiscal deficit. Uh, you know, it, that's an accounting trick, actually. Mm -hmm. Because the fact of the matter is these very large reserves, so-called, uh, most of it is foreign currency uh, revaluation reserves. You can always get the Reserve Bank to transfer money, but you, you have to, the, the Reserve Bank has to control the total amount of money that it prints. So if you take away more through this window, they'll have to squeeze somewhere else. And if they squeeze somewhere else, it's the same thing as you're increasing your fiscal deficit and crowding out the private sector. So it's not as if this is a free lunch, mm. uh, that uh, some calculation here will enable you to get some things, get a real resource mm. that was lying unused. That's not actually true. Okay. Well, uh, now, what the, you know, what the committee does, all the charter, I mean, I'm not really aware of. 
-hmm. Okay, well, time permitting, I'll come back to the accounting uh, 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 probabilities and possibilities of this money. Uh, but Mr. Alwalia, first let me begin by defending my fraternity. Uh, the media did not start this war at all. There was a Viral Acharya speech uh, which uh, pointed out that uh, if governors resign because uh, injustice is done to the reserves of the central bank, it has had repercussions. And my sense is, uh, from Reserve Bank sources, that speech was done only because uh, all methods of persuasion had not succeeded. And we then came to know that c consultation had started under Section 7. A, uh, a, a section which uh, the government has so far never used in, uh, you know, in the over 70 years of the bank's existence. Thereafter, there is a tweet from uh, the finance ministry uh, criticizing the uh, kind of speech made by uh, the deputy governor. This was all out in the open. So th there was a, 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 a fight, a, a serious disagreement, a threat of using Section 7. Do you think at the end of this turmoil, the Reserve Bank has come out looking weaker? Well, let me say that, you know, I don't want to comment on tweets. Uh, mind you, uh, tweets have now become an established currency of communication at very high levels of government all over the world. <laughs> but I still resist the temptation to re react to tweets. It's not my idea of how government should be done. However, let me, let me just make one or two points. One is that, you know, I do not think that on issues of the Reserve Bank and the Finance Ministry, uh, the wor world should be informed by, uh, quietly by officials talking about it. I mean, frankly, I think in many, in many jurisdictions, you know, the governor and the finance minister meet periodically. And I think that's very important. Leaving it to lower level officials is not a good idea. So personally, I mean, I've always felt that, you know, once a month or something like that, uh, the, the governor of the Reserve Bank and the finance minister should meet. Their principal deputies should lay out uh, what are the issues they're going to discuss, so that at any given time, uh, people are not speculating on the basis of what lower level officials are saying, but that the two are in communication at the highest level. I mean, that is very, very crucial. Now, obviously, you know, if, if the two really, really, really disagree, mm. uh, then since the government is sovereign, it always has more power. But, you know, we, we ought to have some reassurance that what we are reading in the newspaper is the outcome of discussions at a high level, not at a lower level. Mm -hmm. And I find I open the newspaper and I find unknown, unnamed officials in the Reserve Bank are saying something, unnamed officials oh. in the Finance Ministry are saying <laughs> no, something. No, no. Frankly, I don't think this is a sensible way of communicating to the markets. No. And no, I, I think the basic idea that, look, we're now integrated with the global economy, we've got to conduct ourselves the way uh, the rest of the world does. No, uh, Mr. Alwalia, I, I mean, let, let me tell you that uh, I'm quoting on the record statements. Uh, Viral Acharya's statement was on the record. Uh, the finance, uh, the DEA secretaries was on the record. Uh, Mr. Gadkari criticized the Reserve Bank for not releasing enough money for road projects about 48 hours ago. That was on the record. This is not unnamed sources. Uh, what I'm asking you is that should Section 7 have been even threatened to be used? Uh, is that weakening uh, both institutions and particularly the Reserve Bank? Well, look, uh, I, you know, any legal use of an existing framework uh, cannot in itself be objected to. I do not know, for example, uh, what is the basis of the statement that Section 7 was threatened to be used. Uh, secondly, it's not very clear to me at what level Section 7 can be threatened. You know, there have been disputes between the Reserve Bank and the government of India before. I mean, when Dr. Manmohan Singh was the governor of the Reserve Bank and uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the prime minister, uh, there was an occasion, I think Dr. Singh has written about it, where the finance ministry decided to take away from the Reserve Bank the power to grant entry to foreign banks to open branches. That decision was actually sent to the cabinet. And it's the cabinet that actually took that decision. Whereupon Dr. Singh, uh, and he's written about this, Dr. Singh 
uh, wrote to the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, and said that, look, if this decision is implemented, I will have to resign. And Mrs. Gandhi actually reversed the Cabinet's decision. So this raises an issue. There have been conflicts before, but, I mean, who can trigger? What is the, what is the process for triggering uh, Section 7? Is it simply some joint secretary can write off? Uh, does it have to be signed off uh, on the file by the finance minister? That, and secondly, what is the threat? Uh, you know, is a threat that if you don't do this, we'll use Section 7? You know, these are all rather... I mean, there, there are uncertainties here. Uh, and to my mind, we ought to be very clear uh, what actually has happened. Uh, at least I have not been very clear uh, when I've read the newspapers on this. But maybe because I don't read the newspapers right. carefully enough and don't follow all the <laughs> tweets. It's my fault. <laughs> well, sir, let, let me now uh, move forward to what is expected to happen, which is on the 14th of December, which is uh, when the Reserve Bank Board will meet again. And uh, what we are given to understand is that the items that could not be taken up yesterday, uh, the governance of the Reserve Bank of India, as well as the liquidity issue, will be taken up on the 14th. Now, when it comes to governance, uh, the thinking, and I go back again to the fact that I don't know whether this is going to be presented in some formal proposal, uh, but the thinking within North Block at this point in time is that the Reserve Bank Board should be empowered, uh, that the Reserve Bank Board members should be empowered, and the RBI should be a board-managed institution. Uh, in light of what you've seen so far play itself out, uh, and given this thinking, what would your expectation be uh, on the 14th of December? What would you not like to see happen? Well, once again, you know, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what uh, the intentions of the government on this are. This is all speculation. But I would certainly say that, uh, the, the, you know, the law on this is a little unclear because there's Section 7.2 mm. and there's Section 7.3. And one of them says that the governor can do everything and the other one says that the board can do everything. So we do need to clarify that. I mean, I think it should be made very clear uh, what exactly is in the powers of the board uh, is it, for example, um, all kinds of administrative matters? Uh, does it, for example, include uh, technical issues, such as, for example, you know, what sort of uh, what sort of criteria you're going to use for lending? What sort of criteria for uh, financing uh, for strengthening the banks? Uh, capital adequacy issues? Are these going to be decided by the board? Uh, or not? I mean, we just need more clarity on this. That's all. Once things are clear, uh, people will then be able to judge what is happening. In a world in which things are not, not clear at all, I mean, every tweet is good enough. So I feel, I feel <laughs> ill-informed on this one, quite honestly. Okay, uh, Mr. Alwalia. Well, uh, I... I Yes, Tata, go ahead. Okay, no, uh, Mr. Aluwalia, you know, actually, if you read the press release, the press release at the end of the meeting clearly says the board, while deciding to retain the CRAR at 9%, agreed to extend the transition period to implementing Basel rules to April 2020, etc., etc. But the point is the board decided the, that the capital adequacy will be 9%. You know, this introduces a new player. Until now, we never thought that the RBI board would, uh, you know, uh, try and decide how much capital adequacy has to be maintained or, uh, uh, you know, uh, what kind of banks should be constrained because they are weak. We thought this was left to the technocrats at RBI. Now that the board is an active board, should we genuinely start worrying about the composition of the board because it is such an important actor? No, that, that goes without, absolutely goes without saying. I mean, if the, if the board is not a purely decorative organization, which for many years it has been, uh, then it's extremely important that the composition of the board and the competence and the background of the people on the board is very carefully worked out. There's no question about that. Okay. Uh, so then that, that will require practically rewriting of the law. Because, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, Act does not really give any qualifications of the board. It merely says that uh, the government shall appoint board members. Uh, does the Act have to be thought through? 
Well, you know, I, I think this is an issue which when the Sri Krishna Committee, the Financial Sector Regulation mm. Committee, uh, submitted a report some years ago, uh, the whole issue of the capacity of our regulatory institutions and how they should be strengthened and how they should be made accountable, this was discussed at great length. And actually, there was no agreement on what to do. So I think this is a sort of a, uh, an unfinished uh, business which was raised, and it's quite reasonable to address the thing seriously. Let me say, by the way, that uh, when you say something must go to the board, I mean, for example, if the only people who can take something to the board uh, are the Reserve Bank management, then the board is actually pronouncing on a management suggestion, and it's up to the management to accept or modify or not. So, you know, a, a lot of how these things are done uh, would actually make it clear uh, to what extent uh, the Reserve Bank uh, governor and deputy governors, etc., mm -hmm. uh, are sharing a little bit of power. Mm. I would certainly say, by the way, that um, in complex banking matters, uh, I do not think that uh, a part-time board appointed by the government uh, should sort of, as it were, overwhelm mm. uh, the decisions of a professionally managed RBI. Okay. Uh, and secondly, if it is a comment on it substantively, it becomes extremely important that the competence of the board members is, uh, as it were, beyond question. Okay. Otherwise, it becomes an, oppor an opportunity uh, to sort of raise questions and create difficulty and so forth, mm. uh, which is not actually very helpful. Okay. Well, a final question to you, Mr. Alwalia. Uh, this, uh, to our knowledge, is the first time that uh, uh, a person who is ideologically inclined to the ruling party has been appointed to the board. I don't know if there is a previous uh, a precedent of, of a person like Mr. Gurumurthy being appointed, who is very clearly heading a group which is aligned to the ruling party. Will this become a precedent now? Uh, every political party that comes try to put, tries to put one of its camp followers or ideologues into the board. And wouldn't that be a worry if this became a precedent? Well, you know, I don't want to comment on the propriety or anything of any individual. So I think on that one, uh, I just leave leave that question for you to you to address. Uh, it's very. It's. Uh, I mean, the important thing is that the competence of the person concerned uh, should be established. Now, who they are aligned with and so on. Uh, but you're right about one thing that um, if you if you um, if you set a, pre a precedent, uh, then you can expect that in future uh, similar things will happen. That's certainly true. <laughs> well, I think uh, you've uh, addressed a lot of the contentious issues, sir, and uh, uh, a lot of it still continues to be in the realm of speculation. Hopefully we will have more clarity on the 14th of December. But for this evening, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18 with your views. Uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia, Deputy Chairperson of uh, the Planning Commission speaking to us on the decisions taken by the Reserve Bank Board after that nine-hour board meeting. We'll take a break. That There's a lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere.